Yo, what's up? We're gonna be looking at something kind of special today. A game with a bit of a weird history, but one that kind of set in motion one of the most important video game trilogies. We're covering Mother, or Earthbound Beginnings, as it's been named. Uh, eh, whole, that's weird. It's kind of a landmark title for the RPG genre, and I'd argue games as a whole. Oh, uh, and this video is kind of important for another reason. It's like a celebration video. Originally, this was going to mark the channel's 100 subscriber milestone, but a certain video overperformed a little bit more than expected. So instead, we're going to be celebrating 200, which is, you know, that's cool. So, like always, if you enjoy this video, don't forget to smash that like button. And if you haven't already subscribed, why not go ahead and do that? And also, don't forget to ring the bell. All right, let's just get right into it. When it comes to cult classic video games, very few titles are as well known as Earthbound. This funky little SNES game has served as the primary inspiration for countless games over the decades since its release. Stuff like Off, Lisa, Contact, Eastward, and Amori to name a few. Uh, oh yeah, and uh, Undertale, I guess. But if Earthbound led to the creation of all of these games, then what game led to the creation of Earthbound? In the mid to late 80s, well-known copywriter and massive Dragon Quest fan Shigesato Itoi decided he wanted to make a video game. Often playing a lot of Famicom games in his free time, he often wondered how he might direct and change the games he was playing. These musings eventually led to an idea for a game of his own, a turn-based RPG set in the modern world. Fortunately, during a visit to the Nintendo headquarters in Kyoto, Itoi was given the opportunity to pitch the game idea to Shigeru Miyamoto himself. At first, Miyamoto wasn't super keen on the idea and told Itoi that he'd have to contribute more than just ideas, pointing out that Itoi had a really busy schedule and that didn't really make him feel super comfortable investing time in the project. Uh, in response to this, Itoi sort of just lessened his workload to have more game dev time. Man, being famous just kind of lets you do stuff, doesn't it? And thus, work on Mother began. Development officially started in 1987, and Itoi brought much more than just ideas to the table. He actually ended up writing the entire game script himself. Uh, around this time, he also founded Ape Inc., a company specifically created to help work on the game. Uh, here's a fun fact. Ape Inc.'s founding would directly lead to the creation of Creatures Inc. as this sort of successor company in 1995. Creatures would later go on to establish the Pokemon Company in 98. So, you know, that's, that's kind of cool. Following a very successful advertising campaign supervised by Etoy, you know, putting all that copywriting to work, Mother released in 1989 for the Famicom, and it was super well received. So well received that they started working on an English localization for the game, planning to bring the RPG to the US under a new title, Earthbound. Now, the story of Mother's localization is this massive saga that I don't really have time to cover. If you are interested, consider checking out Mother to Earth. It's a slick documentary put together by fans of the series. Unfortunately, the conclusion to this saga was the cancellation of Mother's Western release. Okay, well, at least it was cancelled. During 2015's Nintendo World Championship, Nintendo surprisingly announced that Mother would be finally released worldwide on the Wii U Virtual Console under the name Earthbound Beginnings. Flash forward a couple years and Earthbound Beginnings is available to play on Switch through Nintendo's Nintendo Online subscription. Oh, would you look at that? There it is now. In the early 1900s, a dark shadow covered a small country town in rural America. At the time, a young married couple vanished mysteriously from their home. The man's name was George, the woman's name was Maria. Two years later, as suddenly as he left, George returned. He never told anyone where he had been or what he had done, but he began an odd study all by himself. As for Maria, his wife, she never returned. Anyways, here's the game. Uh, it, it isn't a lot to look at, but that's okay. It is a Famicom game from the 80s. Oh, and for those curious, this gameplay was originally streamed over at my uh, Twitch channel. Uh, there'll be a link to that in the description. All right, so this little guy here is Ninten, our protagonist. He's 12. He lives in this little house just outside the town of Podunk with his mom and two sisters, Minnie and Mimi. Today is an ordinary day like any other, until suddenly, evil lamb. For some mysterious reason, strange, paranormal happenings have been occurring across America. For Nintendo's family, it manifests as ghost-possessed light fixtures, for some reason. After smashing some lamps and an evil baby doll to pieces, the ghosts give up and leave the house. It also turns out that that baby doll had this weird music box inside, and when we go ahead and poke it, it just kind of starts playing. Uh, I wonder if that's going to be important later. Now, before we can head out on a grand adventure, we gotta grab the basement key from the doghouse outside. 
uh, then rummage around in the basement to find Nintendo's great-grandfather's diary. This thing will be essential to progress later, so we better grab it now and avoid some backtracking. Great, now we can head off. Okay, I'm not I'm not gonna build up to it. We're we're gonna just we're just gonna start off with one of this game's biggest issues. For some demonic reason, Mother's enemy encounter rate is monstrously high. The game's gotta be checking for an enemy every step or something, because the amount of times you'll end up just getting attacked by snakes or crows or this weird guy named Wally, it's just unreasonable. We actually we actually know the formula for the encounters, but uh, it isn't it isn't very reassuring. Now, before I catch you even remotely considering that this might be a great way to level up quickly, you, you need to understand how slowly you gain experience in this game. The amount of XP needed to move from level 1 to 2 is 10, which might not seem like much except that Wally over here gives around 5 experience, and he almost took me out at level 2. Oh, yeah, that's, a, that's important to mention too. Most enemies in this game are dangerous, and will destroy you without hesitation. So it's not really a matter of grinding to level 2, as much as it's surviving enough encounters to reach that level. Uh, but you know, since we've reached the second level, it's as good a time as any to just make our way into town. Along the way, we run into this woman who's kind of freaking out because her daughter Pippi's gone missing. I mean, we might as well go look for her, it's not like we're doing anything important. Now that we've got our objective, we're gonna have to make our way over to the local cemetery. Unfortunately, due to spooky happenings, the graveyard is currently inhabited by zombies, who are yoked and can one-shot Ninten without much trouble. So we're gonna have to XP grind. So I stopped by the department store to buy some food after a bad run-in with a zombie, and the dude upstairs offered to sell me a canary. I told him I'd just kind of pass, but uh, he, he gave it to me for free. Anyways, back to the zombies. We're level 5 now, so we can take on exactly one zombie without dying. This is good progress. Uh, eventually, after carving a very slow path through the undead, we make it to this one open grave. It leads into a crypt, and at the bottom we find four coffins. Oh look, Pippi's hiding in one of the coffins. Mission accomplished. Uh, there are zombies in the rest of the boxes, and at this point, I'm high enough level that I can just kind of mess them up for experience. From here, we're supposed to take Pippi to the mayor. Instead, I took her with me to the west, toward a little spot known as the Canary Village. Here we can return the canary I was given in the department store to its mother, who in return sings this weird melody. Okay, now we'll take Pippi to the mayor. In exchange for letting him take all the credit, the mayor calls the police by the zoo and lets them know that we're going to be on our way. Well, I guess it's off to the zoo then. Uh, while I'm walking, I'm going to take this time to address another important thing to understand about this game. The map is big. Uh, really big. Getting around from place to place can take a very, very long time, especially when you've got hordes of enemies attacking you, you know, every couple steps. Luckily, there's a sprint button. Holding down B lets you run all over the place. However, while you are covering more distance, the game is checking for enemies more often. So while it doesn't actually increase the enemy encounter rate, it really feels like it is. You know, just something to think about. Anyways, here's the zoo. Before we're even able to get in, we run into this monkey, who immediately steals the key to the zoo and then just smashes the gate open. Okay. From the sound of things, the animals here have gone off the handle due to some strange high-pitched noise. And seeing as how I just got jumped by a depressed hyena, I'd wager that's accurate. Eventually, we arrive at the zoo's administration building. The first thing you'll notice is this horrible droning sound. Oh. Forgot about this horrid... Yeah, okay, that was a choice. Uh, I, I can see why the animals have gone wild. Aside from some very persistent rats, the entire building appears to be abandoned. Well, abandoned until we reach the superintendent's office. Within this room, we find a strange capsule-like object. This is the source of the mayhem-inducing sound. As we attempt to interact with the capsule, it suddenly opens, and an otherworldly foe bursts forth. The arrival of Starman Jr. marks a massive change in Mother's tone, atmosphere, and narrative direction. Up to this point, our only foes have been feral animals, aggressive people, and the undead. Starman Jr. isn't just the addition of aliens to the mix, it's the introduction of a conflict so much greater than we previously understood. That opening scrawl about George and Maria wasn't just cool lore or set dressing, it's real. It's here now, and it sure as hell can use PSI better than you can. Despite him having Junior in his name, Starman Junior is a legitimate threat. While his stats are pretty on par for a boss, the real danger comes from his adept use of PSI skills, especially PK Beam, the most powerful offensive PSI variant. 
After a tough fight, we defeat the star-shaped invader and notice the noises stopped. Yeah, so it turns out this guy's ship was causing all the animals to go nuts. On our way out of the zoo, I decide to pay the monkey a visit. He seems happy that the sound has stopped and rewards us by singing us another strange melody. Okay, we're starting to collect a couple of these now. So from here, we're supposed to go back to the mayor and tell him we fixed the zoo situation, but frankly, his vibes are awful, so I'm not going to do that, and instead I'm going to head east until I find this little cave. Inside the cave is a strange pink seashell-shaped stone with a pair of X's carved into its surface. This monument is constantly emitting a telepathic message that can only be detected by those with PSI powers. That being said, the message is this weird riddle and it just doesn't make any sense. Luckily, I have the Great Grandfather's Diary, which um, has, the, has the answer just kind of written in it. Holding the answer in his mind, Ninten is enveloped by a flash of light and transported to another world. Welcome to Magicant. From the hit video game Super Smash Brothers. Magicant is a very strange world. The ground is made of clouds, the people talk and dress strangely, and everything seems to have this pinkish hue to it. It feels like something out of a dream. Okay, so supposedly everyone here is your friend or something to that extent. This is a lie. This is actually another one of this game's patented grind zones. Several hours of grinding and a boomerang later, we can finally proceed with the story. Stopping by this big castle, we learn that the local monarch, Queen Mary, has lost the ability to sing and fall into a deep melancholy due to forgetting a very important song. Man, that's a bummer. Anyways, we're given the onyx hook and told how to return to Earth. To do this, we need to make our way through the Crystal Caves, which isn't too difficult to do after getting a few more levels under our belt. There is this big sleeping dragon down here, but he isn't really important, so we'll just kind of ignore him for the moment. When we finally reach the bottom of the caves, we're spat out into this other cave, which looks very familiar. I assure you, it is different. This one curves slightly differently. Oh right, and it's south of the city of Marysville, which has nothing of value in it except for Twinkle Elementary School, which is full of horrible, disease-bearing children. No, no, I'm, I'm serious. If you talk to any of the students in the school, there's a chance to get the cold status condition, like, like, a, like you get a, the common cold. There's no warning that you caught it. You just start taking chip damage every few steps, which is very frustrating. But you want to know what's more frustrating? The only ways to clear this condition is to either visit a hospital and have the doctor clear it, or to use an item that we won't have access to for several hours. Whee! Fun game design! Now the real reason we're here is to meet this guy, Lloyd. He's a, uh, he's inside the trash can. Well, okay, he's been bullied a lot, so he's on the roof hiding in the trash can. But if we show him a bottle rocket, he'll be willing to talk to us. This next section of the game consists of exploring two different factories without and then with Lloyd in the party. So I'm just going to use this time to address the most infamous section of the game, Duncan's Factory. By now you've probably noticed that this game is a bit visually illegible, like just a bit. Everything looks very similar, and the way the map is designed makes it a bit hard to tell where anything and everything is. This makes the map being so big an even greater crime. Now Duncan's Factory on the other hand, it should probably just be brought to the Hague. Everything looks the same in here. It sucks. And the dungeon is designed to make the players use all these ladders to get everywhere. Ugh. Without a map, you're just going to get lost. The readability of the world is actually a prevalent issue throughout the whole game. It just happens that Duncan's Factory is especially guilty of it. Which is why I had a set of maps on hand for my entire playthrough. Okay, now that we're here, we need to find a rocket so that we can launch it and blow up some boulders north of Marysville. And we also got to make sure Lloyd survives the entire trip. Because if he's not alive when we get there, the cutscene won't trigger, and we'll have to walk all the way back to town, and then back through the factory again. Mm. While I was in here, I also made sure to grab a super important item. The Franklin Badge has become one of the main symbols associated with the Mother franchise, and for good reason. This thing is super useful in all three of the games. In Earthbound and Mother 3, this handy little badge reflects back lightning-based attacks, preventing some pretty nasty endgame damage. Mother's Badge is a little bit more niche. Its only purpose is to protect against the dreaded PK Beam Gamma, the game's only one-shot kill attack. Now, the badge only protects the person who's holding it, but that doesn't really matter if you can just reflect an insta-kill move back at an enemy who's hitting you. 
which is why it's super fortunate that this game has two Franklin badges. There's one here in the factory, and the other is... Ah. Okay, so Pippi's supposed to give it to you after you take her back home. But you have to talk to her twice. Whoops. With the rock broken, we're free to head north to Union Station and take the train. We're gonna be making two stops, once at Reindeer, and then finally at Snowman. While we ride, I really do need to touch on something. So far, I've been pretty harsh on this game. I could even understand if someone assumed I just didn't like it by how I've been talking. The truth is, I really, really do love this game. The game's premise, world, and soundtrack come together to present an experience that doesn't feel like anything else at the time. It truly feels like something different, something special, and I love it for that. None of the other entries in the Mother franchise managed to capture the weird road-tripping feel this game has, nor nail the illusion of a massive, dangerous, mysterious world. It really does feel like a one-of-a-kind adventure. So, the reason we're making a stop here in Reindeer is to get this hat from the old lady at the station. This belongs to our third party member, Anna, the daughter of the pastor and snowman. She literally will not join the party without it. Now, the issue we run into in Snowman is that it's swarming with wolves and yeti, and they will one-shot our new level 1 party member without, like, any trouble. So, after picking up Anna, we're just gonna use a tactical onyx hook to warp to magic hand and skip the murder wolves. Our next objective is to head to the city of Spookane to deal with a ghost issue. Before that, however, we'll be making another stop in Reindeer to get some mouthwash from a weird old man. Uh, this is that cold curing item I mentioned. It also sells for a lot of money, which will allow us to buy weapons of mass destruction. Getting off the train at Spookane Station, the first thing you'll notice is the city is completely abandoned. Well, except the guy at the hotel. He's offering some killer deals on rooms right now. The, uh, the catch being, he's actually a star man, and he wants us dead. Turns out that due to the uptick in ghosts in the area, the people of Spookane have all ended up just hiding in the rich neighborhood outside of town. You know, maybe if you changed your town name, you wouldn't be having this issue. Our objective is within Rosemary Manor, uh, the home of the richest family in the area, and also the place most infested with undead. Rosemary Manor is another grind barrier. This, paired with the high-level enemies and confusing layout, makes it a really dangerous area to spend too much time in. Good thing, then, that Ninten has reached big status and can smack the ghosts away without much trouble. With the help of my map, we reach the inner room and find the house's haunted grand piano. I, um, I might have also at this point realized that I forgot to buy Lloyd and Anna their weapon upgrades. But that's not super important. I swear. With another melody acquired, we set off back towards Union Station. So here's a cool thing about this game. Technically, it's non-linear. Sure, there's a best way to do everything to prevent getting stomped by the random encounters, but you can technically do things in whatever order you want the second that you finish Duncan's factory. I bring this up because my next objective is supposed to be a singing cactus in the desert, followed by a return trip to Magicant. So my party got killed by UFOs the second I entered the desert. Now, I could make the humiliating trek back to Marysville and pay a ton of money to res my party at the hospital, or... I can break the intended sequence and brute force my way through the southernmost part of the desert towards the city of Youngtown. This is skipping like two melodies and two major bosses, by the way. Youngtown is a settlement currently solely populated by children. Asking around reveals that all the adults got abducted by the invading aliens. This is also where the psychic baby lives. Yes, there's a, there's a psychic baby in this game. The kid has a frankly stupid amount of PSI power, but they can't really do anything with it since they're a baby. What they can do is use telepathy to teach us the secrets of teleportation. This means we can warp back to Marysville to resurrect our party, then warp back to Youngtown and level grind. We. Now that we're no longer getting stomped by everything in the desert, we can pay the cactus a visit. Next we have to find this war vet that just lives out here. Supposedly, he planted mines in the desert during the last war, but like, this is set in the USA, so either he's really old, or something's up. Regardless, we need to ride in this guy's plane enough times to have 10 ticket stubs, so then we can borrow his tank. Which lets us just kinda trek over here and waste this robot. But, um, kinda breaks the tank in the process. Yeah, well, not our tank. 
So what we're actually trying to find out here is these ruins called the Monkey Grotto. It's like this weird cave full of monkeys who lie compulsively. It, it's just flavor. We're not actually here for the monkeys. We're actually looking for a second entrance to Magicant, which is down at the bottom of the cave here. All right, story time. While I was streaming my playthrough of Mother, someone named M. Tigers dropped by to hang out for a little bit. As it just so happens, they're a well-known, influential member of the Mother speedrunning community, famous for discovering that the popular breadcrumb skip from the Famicom version of the game still works in the GBA re-release, Mother 1 Plus 2. While they were explaining some of the weird nuances of how the game's code works, they happened to ask whether or not I was planning to bomb the dragon. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, what? Turns out, after you clear Duncan's factory, a crazy scientist sets up shop in one of the Twinkle Elementary classrooms. He sells bombs. But not any old bombs. Super bombs. You know, the, the kind that one-shot entire enemy encounters? Eh, well, except for bosses. It's programmed not to work on, on bosses. Um, most of them. So anyways, check this out. And I got a melody out of it, too. Leaving Magicant, we end up in a new cave just north of Youngtown. Uh, this is when you're supposed to visit the town, but since we've already been here, I'll just skip the walking and teleport instead. As it just so happens, this town actually has new weapon upgrades for Anna and Lloyd. These are kind of nice, but since Lloyd should really only be using the lasers from Reindeer, and Anna's PK beam is much stronger than any physical attacks she could throw out, it really is just kind of a last resort precaution. You know? It's been a couple seconds since we had a grinding section. We should probably look into that, shouldn't we? Ah, the swamp. That'll work. The marshland that separates Youngtown from the city of LA is crawling with all kinds of dangerous creatures. This is around the time that regular starmen become generic field enemies, which is kind of a cool measure of our progress. You know, when I'm not getting death rolled by gators, after a very arduous journey, we arrive in LA. Now, despite what the name sounds like, we're not actually in California. According to the official Mother What maps, this region of America that we're in borders the Pacific Ocean, which means that LA is actually far to the north. Considering that Mount Itoi is supposed to be the tallest peak in the region, that means its closest real-world equivalent would be uh, Mount Rainier. That means the whole game probably takes place in Washington which in turn would most likely mean LA is actually Tacoma or Seattle. Anyways, there's a ton of gang violence here. The whole city has been seemingly taken over by a group called the Black Blood Gang, or Blah Blah Gang in the localization. Its leader is this super strong monster of a guy who shouldn't have any trouble taking our entire party out. Okay, well, that, at least that's what his goons are saying. Now, whenever you talk to one of these gang members, they'll end up picking a fight with you at the end of their dialogue. They don't give much XP for beating them, but they do have a chance to drop a flame. So I'm just gonna go ahead and pick one of those up. We'll eventually find ourselves at the live house, mostly because it's the only distinct building, but we can't actually enter until we pay that old soldier back for wrecking his tank. There are some people in here that will offer to get you a drink, which by itself is sus, but it gets even more wild when you immediately get arrested for attempted underage drinking if you say yes. I feel like there's some kind of racket going on in here. Talking to this dude by the stage, he'll offer to let the group go up and do a little performance, which leads to this super cute singing and dancing segment where the group performs the song All I Needed Was You. It isn't quite to the level of the FF6 opera scene, but having an entire musical number is equal parts impressive and adorable. When the song finishes, however, the door kicks in to reveal the big bad leader of the Black Bloods, Teddy. Turns out, he caught wind of me farming his thugs for that flamethrower, and now he's here for payback. He challenges Nintendo to a 1v1 slugfest, but after three rounds decides that he's pretty tough, and he'd rather just team up with him to seek revenge for his parents who were killed by creatures on Mount Etoy. Oh, um, Lloyd's a wuss though, so he's not allowed to be in the party anymore. Alright, so Teddy's actually kind of the coolest. Not only are his offensive physical stats stupidly good, his history is just wild. Apparently, he started randomly picking fights with people when he turned 5, and then he was over 5 foot 6 by the age of 10. And then he got his first job at the live house at 12, just by lying and claiming he was actually 24, which the people there just believed. He then became the leader of the Black Bloods at age 14, 
Uh, he also has this rock and pompadour and cool sunglasses. Man, I wish I was as cool as Teddy. Now that the big band has joined our party, we've reached the end game. All that's left to do is climb Mount Etoy and put an end to the invasion once and for all. Mount Etoy and its summit are the most dangerous areas in the game, with most enemies able to easily wipe your party with ease if you're not careful. Making your way to the top is an endeavor, to say the least. Man, I've, I've been putting this off for a while, but this is as good a time as any. I, I love this game. I, I need to put that out there before I continue. I love the atmosphere, I love the music, I love the world and the characters. I love what this game did for RPGs and video games as a whole. I love this game for introducing me to the Mother franchise. I love this game so, so much. And so it really hurts to admit, Mother is not a fun game to play. When it comes to RPGs, I expect a little bit of leveling to be needed as you make your way through the game. Mother requires way more than a little bit of leveling. The long periods of grinding required to progress through the game are tedious. Full stop. The clunky and obtuse UI is horribly dated. The world is just not great to move around, even with a fan-made map. And the difficulty progression for enemies is just... It's, it's stupid. Playing through this final stretch of the game was not only exhausting, but felt unrewarding up until I was standing in front of the final boss. So let's break down how this final stretch of the game is supposed to work. We need to fight our way up Mount Etoy collecting Ninten, Ana, and Teddy's final weapons along the way. Our goal is this cabin right here before the plateau. It not only has a phone to save our game, but also a medicine man to rest and heal at. The catch, however, is if you overextend yourself for even an instant, your party is likely to just get wiped out. If that happens, you respawn at the last used phone, the closest of course being the one in the apartment store in LA. Meaning we need to start the trek up the mountain over again, plus the extra walk time from the city to just get to the foot of the mountain. My advice for this section is just don't fight anything. Abuse 4D slip to escape encounters until you run out of PP, then just pray the run command doesn't let you down. When we eventually reach the cabin, we kind of just need to level grind until Ana knows PK Beam Gamma at level 25. This is made easier by Teddy's monstrous attack and speed stats, which allow him to take out most enemies before they can even react, but otherwise, we just, we just pray we don't get critted. Once we're at a comfortable level, or just too bored to keep grinding, we'll walk through this door in the cabin. Doing so triggers a cutscene where Ninten and Ana admit they have feelings for each other, and then they do this little dance, and it's very cute. Good for them. As soon as they finish, however, Teddy bursts into the room to let us know we're under attack. That robot from the desert is back, with an upgrade and he's pissed. This fight is unwinnable, and eventually results in Teddy being the last standing trying to solo the robot to no success. Tried your best, man. I, I respect the tenacity. At the last moment, however, Lloyd shows up to save the day, and he's brought the tank. Uh, his shot goes a bit wide, however, and he hits all of us. The game cuts to the medicine man's shack at the base of the mountain. Teddy's not doing too well, having taken most of the robot's blows to protect Ninten and Ana. Raspily, Teddy admits that brute strength won't be enough to fend off the invaders, but that he believes that peace can still be won. Lloyd, with newfound conviction, tells Teddy that now it's the weakling's turn to fight, and to wait here and get some rest. With Lloyd back in the party, we can finally close out the game. But first, we need to climb Mount Etoy again, with a severely underleveled party member. And no Teddy to help us steamroll encounters. Okay, it's time for Anna's insta-kill attack to be put to work. When we eventually reach the cabin again, we can press on further up the mountain. Here we find a large lake with a broken down motorboat. Lloyd's the only one who can get this thing moving again, so it's probably good that he's here. We sail out onto the lake and almost immediately get pulled into a whirlpool. Deep under the waters of Mount Etoy's lake lies a secret laboratory. In the furthest depths of the meadow-walled structure, we find her. Level Grind 3000. I, uh, I mean Eve. This robot was created by George. Yes, that George. In order to protect Ninten and help him drive off the alien invasion. Oh, yeah, it, it turns out that George was Ninten's great-grandfather this whole time. Wow. Eve doesn't technically count as a party member, but she's gonna help us fight nonetheless. She's got max stats and seemingly infinite HP, which means we can begin the final level grind session of the game. Oh, and we also can't go back down the mountain or we trigger the penultimate boss fight. 
After getting Ninten to level 34, we're able to cross this tiny stretch of land and trigger the aforementioned fight. It's that damn robot again, back with a slick new red paint job. So, due to the giant robot's defense being just really, really high, we can't actually contribute to this boss fight, and we just kind of sit here watching them kill each other. Unfortunately, R7038 just kind of does a little bit more damage, and will eventually end up defeating Eve, who in response self-destructs, taking him down with her. That is, that is some ultra-hater energy right there, Jesus. Collecting the seventh melody from Eve's failing circuits, we can make the final push towards the summit. When asked about the final section of the game in an interview, Itoi admitted that due to a fast approaching release date, the game balance team hadn't really had a chance to go over the stats of the enemies in this area. Which means they can one-shot you pretty much regardless of what level you are. So I guess it's time to break out the classic run away from everything strat just one more time. After dodging at least 50 different killer robots, we finally reach the summit of Mount Etoy. Here we find the XX Stone, George's Grave. When we interact with it, a crystal appears, which has a pre-recorded message inscribed within. Ninten, welcome. I always believed that you would find your way here. Your great-grandmother Maria's love was scattered. Scattered in the form of melodies. I have a melody for you. Listen. With this gift, we finally have all eight melodies, and, making one final trip to Magicant, we return to Queen Mary. When we present her with the completed melodies, she requests that we sing them for her, so she can finally remember what she has forgotten. Upon hearing the song, memories flood her mind. She remembers that she's Maria, she remembers raising Gygus as her own son, and she remembers how happy they were, and how she would sing him to bed with a lullaby. Whispering to George that her purpose is finally complete, Maria's form vanishes, whisked away on the wind and Magicant with her. The world born of her dreams having served its purpose ceases to exist. We return to the real world, standing once more before George's grave. All that's left for us is to enter the cave and challenge Gygus once and for all. There are no enemies inside this cave, but there is this one strange room off to the side. It's full of capsules holding all the kidnapped people from across America. Determined to free them and stop the invasion once and for all, we step out onto the peak of Mount Etoy. A great ship rises from below the cliff's edge, and we find ourselves face to face with the leader of the invasion, Gygus. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for a sec. This final battle has some pretty intense flashing lights and bright colors. I'm going to limit how much I show on screen, but I do want to offer a warning to any photosensitive viewers. If that's you, I'd recommend scrolling down and hanging out in the comments, or just going to another tab until the fight ends. Or you could just turn your phone face down, you know, whatever works best for you. The final battle with Gygus is unorthodox. Okay, well, it was for 1989. Due to Gygus' incredible physical abilities and superior control over PSI, it's actually impossible to defeat him through combat. Instead, the only way to defeat him is through song. Unfortunately for us, he has no intention of letting us do that, and will cut off the party whenever they try. So what we're gonna do is put up our strongest PSI shields and just sing at him until he listens. As these three try and try to get their song through to Gygus, he pushes back over and over again, lashing out with incomprehensible attacks. Eventually, however, we wear him down. Overwhelmed with the sadness and guilt over his betrayal of Maria's upbringing, Gygus is unable to continue fighting. As he flees, however, he vows to one day return and face Ninten again. And with that, Gygus' ship flies off. Okay, it'll, it'll leave eventually. Hey, would you look at that? We've saved the world! There's a bit of an epilogue that closes out the game. All the captured people are freed, reuniting Anna with her missing mother. Oh wait, did I cover that? Teddy makes a full recovery and gets a job as a musician, performing live shows in LA. All the adults return to Youngtown. Ahn returns home to Snowman, promising to one day meet Ninten again. Lloyd is treated like a hero when he gets back to Twinkle Elementary. Ninten is welcomed home by his family, and Anna receives a letter from him, informing her that he's finally arrived home. And finally, with the crisis averted, Ninten decides to take a little nap. Then there's this fun little curtain call segment as the credits roll, followed by an unexpected sight. Ninten's dad is at a phone trying to reach his son. It seems some new trouble has turned up, but that's a story for another time. And that, my friends, is Mother. 
an overwhelmingly heartfelt RPG full of quirky characters, silly dialogue, and undeniable soul. I love almost everything that this game represents, and especially love the foundation it built for some of the greatest games ever to launch from. Unfortunately, it's with a heavy heart that I need to reiterate, this is not a fun game to play. The unbalanced leveling experience, overwhelming number of enemy encounters, and incredibly same feeling overworld makes for a frequently tedious and drawn out game that leans more frustrating than it does fun. Man, if only there was like a modernization of this game, like a remake, you know, something that took all the lessons and techniques the games that followed it have and, you know, applied it to Mother's vibrant and exciting world. Boy, do I have news for you. I played you. This was actually a giant, unaffiliated, ad for Mother Encore, a fan-made reimagining of Mother that modernizes the game while attempting to keep the soul of the original alive. And man does it look good. There's not a release date yet, but the project seems to be coming along pretty well so far. Anyways, go check out the official site, the trailer, and give the demo a spin. And with that, you've made it to the end of the video. If you enjoyed, why not drop a like? And while you're down there, just hit the subscribe button and the bell. It's free, it's easy. Like I said, this is a bit of a celebration for the channel. We've passed 200, maybe even 225 by the time this comes out, so it's a, it's a feel-good kind of time. Regardless, thanks a ton for watching. It really does mean a lot to me, and I appreciate the support. For now, though, that's all from me. Thanks again, and I'll see you around.